Good evening. This is Teresa Matsura from Uncanny Japan, and I'm going to tell you a bedtime story. But first, let me explain. A bedtime story is something I do for my $5 and up patrons. Once a month, I research and translate an obscure Japanese fairy tale. Then, I reimagine or tweak the tale as necessary, and finally, record it with cool background music. It's me in your headphones once a month reading to you an old Japanese folktale before you fall asleep. The stories I choose range from dark, weird, funny, surreal, to downright creepy. You never know what you're going to get. So here we go. Tonight's bedtime story is called The Melon Princess and the Heavenly Demon. It's a tale found throughout Japan. But while there are dozens, if not hundreds, of versions of it here, I don't think it's very well known outside the country. The one that I translated and reimagined and am going to read now on my Patreon page will be the PG version. A darker, more messed up story, more closer to the original, will go out to my patrons this month. So I hope. You are all tucked comfy into bed because tonight I'm going to tell you about the Melon Princess and the Heavenly Demon. Mukashi Mukashi, in long ago Japan, there lived an old man and an old woman. Their life was simple and for the most part good, but they were missing something. One single thing that from the time they were married 50 years prior, Bore a shadow that grew darker and heavier with the passage of time. A child. They had always wanted a child. Someone to adore and dote on, to watch grow and to love unconditionally. The time had long passed to have one of their own, so most nights were spent sitting on the dirt floor of their small thatched home, a crackling fire between them, lamenting their fate. That went on for years until, as luck, good or bad, one cannot judge, would have it. The couple's sadness and regret became too much, and the shadow that tormented them grew too heavy. No one is sure what happened exactly, but it somehow caused their minds to change in a peculiar way. One day they woke up and heard birdsong outside their window and were convinced. It was the sound of children laughing and playing. It was then they began to collect birds in earnest. The old man left early every morning to tramp through the hills and capture the creatures, while his wife sat at home weaving beautifully intricate cages to place them in sparrow hawks, skylarks, swallows, and the exceptionally noisy and foul tempered bull headed shrike. All variety of bird filled their home. Every wall was lined with bamboo ribbed cages, stacked from ceiling to floor. They hung from the rafters and eaves that surrounded the house. There were so many that the extras had to be shoved into the cellar along with the clay pots full of pickled plums and vinegared cabbage. The old man and the old woman cared for the birds dearly. And as much as they could, they loved them and doted on them and pretended that they were their own children. It didn't quite feel right, though. In moments when they were more lucid, somewhere in their skewed thoughts, they both knew not one of these chatty animals was a real child. One morning, after a particularly lucid realization, the old man reluctantly hauled his nets into the forest, as was his habit. While his wife took a break from her cage weaving and carried their terribly threadbare clothing down to the river to wash, she knelt by the shore and began scrubbing the worn out laundry, careful not to tear any more holes. Zabu, 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 she washed. After some time, she heard a noise. Zen, buku, kam, buku, zen, buku, kam, buku, and looked up. There, Rolling down the river toward her was a large melon perfectly intact. 
Zen buku kam buku. She waded out and snatched the fruit from the water. Hora, what a fine melon. I'll take it home. The old woman, in her excitement, left the laundry and her scrubbing stone and as quickly as she could tottered back to her home with the melon in her arms. When her husband returned, after depositing three pigeons and a raggedy-looking crow into the cages, he remarked, What a fine melon! Let's crack it open and eat it. The old man reached for the butcher's knife that he always kept stuck in a fat, roughly sanded chunk of wood that he sometimes used as a table. He was just about to bring it down on the fruit when it burst open by itself and a baby slid out. Ho ho geya, ho ho geya, the baby cried. Ma! The old woman nearly fainted in delight. She clapped her hands together and exclaimed, A baby girl! The gods have blessed us with a baby girl! The old man hugged his wife tightly, wiped a tear from his eye and said, Let's call her the Melon Princess. The old woman agreed. That was a wonderful name. The couple raised the girl. They adored her doted on her, and loved her unconditionally. The shadow retreated. Soon, though, they noticed something odd about their dear, sweet melon princess. That is, she grew at a disconcerting rate, each month of her life equaling a year in real time. After twelve months, for all intents and purposes, she looked and acted like a twelve-year-old child, but the old couple were grateful for her presence and still a bit soft in the heads and dared not question why. Something else interesting happened on that first birthday. Up until then, the girl's only interest was taking care of the hundreds and hundreds of birds. She called them her brothers and sisters, and there were so many now that in order to keep them, the old man had to build a new room and dig a deeper cellar. The melon princess continued to tend to her feathered siblings, but the day after her birthday, she cobbled together a loom and began weaving, gathering the fallen feathers and down from the chittering birds during the day. She spent her nights at the loom, weaving the softest and most beautiful of fabrics. The colors were those of the birds, rich chestnut and smoky gray, golden yellow, and pigeon neck green. Tokking gakari king gatari, tokking gakari king gatari, was the sound of her loom. Over and over, the shuttle sliding across the threads, the reed tamping the newest strand into place. The girl continued like this for another year, tending the birds, weaving the fabric, and making her parents very happy indeed. The weight of the shadow had entirely vanished, and the old couple now spent their nights huddled near the fire, listening to the soothing sound, Toking Gakari King Gatari, and extolling their wonderful luck. Life was better than it had ever been. On the Melon Princess's second birthday, she was twenty-four years old, and a beautiful young woman whom many neighboring townsmen had heard rumors about. The old couple were now feeling their ages and began to worry what might come of their precious daughter when they passed on to the Buddha's paradise. It's unfair of us to keep her here, the old woman said one evening to her husband. I want what's best for our daughter. Perhaps her happiness lies outside these walls, out from under this roof. But the Melon Princess knows nothing of the outside world. She doesn't know what horrors lie in the forests, in the caves, in wicked men's hearts. She is a bit naive. Will she be okay? It was true, the Melon Princess had only been alive on this earth for two years, and the old couple had protected her so carefully that she had very little experience with the outside world. But maybe they could find the perfect man for her. 
someone who would protect her and love her just as dearly as they did. It didn't take long, but after many suitors came to visit and were tested and examined in various ways, they all decided on the fellow who would become her husband. He was a fine man, strong and brave, with rice fields and money. He had a calm nature and a good heart. Even his mother-in-law seemed like a decent person. Surely this man would give their melon princess a secure and a happy life. It was decided. But first, the old couple needed to go into town with the entirety of their small savings and purchase the items for the melon princess's dowry. The trip would be long, and they would have to spend the night in town. This was the first time they would leave the young girl alone after dark. They were anxious and afraid. But the old man explained the situation, and his bird-tending, feather-weaving daughter seemed to understand. On the day they left, the old man said, Melon Princess, after we shut this door, do not open it for anyone. There are awful creatures who lurk in the forest near here, and they would wish you harm. There is one in particular who dwells near here called the Amenojaku. He cannot enter if you do not allow him to. Keep shut the doors and the windows. There is no need to go out. We will return tomorrow with your dowry and open the door ourselves. With that, they kissed their daughter on the forehead, slid shut the paper door, and set off on their journey. Tokingakari kingatari Tokingakari kingatari The melon princess was content to work her loom and weave her cloth. The soothing sound of cheeps and chirps, scratching on hay, and the lofty cloud sound of flapping wings all around her. Time flew quickly as it did, and soon it was dark. She covered the cages with her pretty cloths and sat back down to work. Ton, ton, ton. Someone was knocking at the door. Ton, ton, ton. Melon princess, melon princess, please open the door so we can play. Damn it, the girl said. I'm not allowed to let anyone in. No one is home. Ton, ton, ton. Melon princess, melon princess. Just open the door a little. Damn it, she said again. There are things in the forest that might wish me harm. Ton, ton, ton. Melon princess, melon princess. I only want to play. Why don't you open the door just a crack? The width of a fingernail would do. The melon princess thought about this. The girl got up from her loom and did as she was asked. She opened the door the tiniest of bits. But as soon as she did, a single long claw slid through the gap and flung the door open so hard that it shattered against the wall. A foul horrible-looking creature, and Amano Jaku leapt into the room. The melon princess collapsed to the floor. She had never seen anything so awful. The monster stood, its giant body hunched beneath the cage-lined ceiling. The birds, blind to what was going on, screeched and fluttered, their blanketed cages looking like gray and brown ghosts about the room. The Amano Jaku leaned over her, so close she was looking straight up into its open mouth full of teeth, its putrid breath panting, warming her. She watched as a line of drool ran down the beast's chin and onto her foot. She jerked her leg away. The creature chuckled. <laughs> the melon princess was terrified but also intrigued. Its skin, she thought. It was a color she had never seen before a deep burnished red, somehow angry and so very alive. And from that skin, the Amano Jaku emanated the smell of old forest, 
rotting pine needles, and the musky reek of the civets her father sometimes brought home. It wasn't entirely disagreeable. The beast spoke, knocking her out of her thoughts. Let's play, it said. Let's play, and then I shall eat you. I do not want to play. Her senses coming back to her, realizing the danger she was in. Then I shall only eat you. The Amanojaku opened its mouth wider and ran its tongue over the top row of teeth. The melon princess screamed and scrambled backwards. The birds all around her echoed her fear and shrieked louder, the cacophony deafening. The girl's retreat was stopped when her back hit the block of wood her father sometimes used as a table. The Amanojaku chuckled again. <laughs> the melon princess reached behind her and found the handle of the butcher's knife her father kept there. You are a dim child. Such a blade cannot hurt me. The beast then grabbed her by the leg and lifted her so that she was dangling before him. One strike of the blade hit the monster on the shoulder, but no damage was done. He was right. You are bothersome and no fun at all. I will eat you whole. The Amanojaku opened its mouth even wider than before. Just then, the girl swung the knife around, not aiming at the beast, but at the cages. The blade sliced through the cloth and the thin bamboo ribs, again and again, freeing the birds. They screeched and squawked and attacked the Amanojaku, some flying into its mouth, tearing at its tongue, while others preferring its eyes. The monster dropped the melon princess to the floor and began batting the birds away with both hands, retreating as he did. Blinded and panicked, the monster did not see the entrance to the cellar. The cellar, also full of even more of the girl's angry siblings. The Amanojaku fell into the cellar, crashing and bursting open more cages as he did. The birds, the brothers and sisters, did their work. The next morning, when the melon princess's parents returned with their cart loaded with offerings to her future husband's family, they found the girl in her room at the loom. All the birds had been freed and sat or rested quietly about the house. Toking gakari king gatari, toking gakari king gatari. We're home, her mother cried relieved to see that the girl was alive and well. Oh, you have been working through the night, the old woman said, noticing the pile of cloth by her side. Oh, we are so glad you are safe. Toking gakari king gatari Toking gakari king gatari Yes, I am quite safe. But I think I do not wish to marry this man you have found for me. I would rather stay here with my family who loves me and dotes on me. I would rather weave beautiful cloth to sell in town so we never have to want for money again. Why, why, that's fine too, said the old man, secretly elated at her decision. The old woman exchanged a glance with her husband and smiled. She then looked closer at the new pieces of fabric. Ma, cried the old woman. Look at this gorgeous new cloth you have woven. I have never seen such a beautiful color, such a deep and gorgeous red. She pulled at the fabric and then draped it around her shoulders. Oh, and it's so strong, too. The end. Good night, and Oyasumi. Oh